Thank you so much, Dr. Baldwin, for sharing that uh, overview of the CDC's effort and for your continued leadership. <clears throat> we'll now move into our panel of health plan speakers who will be sharing initiatives to address opioid abuse through clinical, pharmacy, and community efforts. Our first speaker will be Tom Kowalski. Tom has worked as a pharmacist in a variety of community settings before joining Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. As the Director of Clinical Pharmacy, he's responsible for the development, implementation, and management of clinical and safety programs for drugs in their pharmacy and medical benefits. Tom? Thank you, Catherine. Um, so I'll move to my first couple of slides relatively quickly since I don't want to bore you and be repetitive. Uh, I just wanted to show you again what's, what our previous speakers have, sp have spoken about is uh, the epidemic both nationally and in Massachusetts of what we've seen historically. Um, and, and basically this is what has driven us to develop our program. Again, as you see, this slide, uh, uh, poisoning overdeaths in Massachusetts in 2010 was almost 30 percent. Uh, again, something that was very alarming to us uh, and felt that um, caused us to, to take some action on what we did and how we w tried to develop a safety program for our members. Again, just another graphic, because I like pictures. Uh, but this is, you've heard this before, and again, just the cost and the, the number of people that this affects is just staggering. And we really felt from a health plan perspective as well as from a, a social perspective uh, out, um, that we really needed to do something that was impacting our members and our, our prescribers as well as our accounts. So if we look to look, the next slide is what we actually uh, implemented our program in July 1st of 2012. Uh, and what we did was we really took a deep dive into our data and, and broke our data into short-acting opioids, those that have a duration of four to six hours, long-acting opioids, those that have duration of uh, 10 to 12 hours, and then we looked at our members using Suboxone. And what was really interesting for the majority of what we saw for short-acting is that it was being prescribed appropriately. It was you know, 11% uh, and most of them were getting a prescription for less than seven days. However, there were about 15% of them who were getting prescriptions for greater than 30 days, which we felt may be inappropriate and in exposing them to a risk of addiction. When we looked at the long acting, we saw that it was again about 1% of the people using it. But what concerned us was that about 15% of them had a prescription for a, uh, about 30 days and it seemed to us that this was their first line of age, uh, first agent uh, of use. They did not show any short-acting opioids, and again, starting a uh, long-acting opioid before short-acting opioids seemed inappropriate to us for somebody trying to treat acute, uh, an acute uh, condition, which is what our data was showing us. And then finally, when we looked at our Suboxone members, we saw that about a third of them were actually receiving these, these prescriptions from a variety of prescribers and pharmacies. And we felt that that was an issue in terms of continuity of care and were our members really receiving the best care by having to switch around or by switching around and what was the reason for that. So when we looked at our program, we had done a couple of different things on the management side. We had worked and had done formulary. We had done tier placement. We had done some quantity limits. We had done some prior odds on a drug here, on a drug there. We really didn't do anything comprehensive. We had a little bit of um, you know, management in place, but not much at all. But when we looked at the data, we really felt that we needed to come up with a comprehensive, all-encompassing plan that was going to address the issues we saw in a, in a smart uh, a way that did not interfere with uh, access to care or getting the medication when people actually needed it for the conditions they needed it. So we had three goals in mind. It was uh, make it affordable and accessible. Uh, we wanted to make sure that people had uh, appropriate pain care, that they weren't being denied access to it. So we actually excluded uh, anybody with cancer or a terminal illness from our program. And the other two components were, were primarily reduced at uh, decreasing addiction and diversion by decreasing the amount of prescription drugs dispensed at any one particular time. So those were our primary goals. 
And then uh, based on our consultation with experts uh, in the community, pharmacists, physicians, caregivers who are uh, working with people uh, either with addiction problems or treating chronic pain, uh, in working with our Mass Medical Society, our, um, our uh, Board of Pharmacy, uh, physicians, uh, osteopaths, emergency room physicians, um, and uh, addictionologists, we actually came up with a, a, a multi-pronged approach and, and, and listed on this page is the approach that we took and we put in place on July 1st, day one, uh, and put them all into place and, and away we went with the program. So first thing we did was we realized that uh, we still had some opioids going through mail order. So we, did, we didn't think it was an appropriate place for somebody to be getting a 90-day supply of drugs uh, of this caliber from mail order. So we blocked that. It was about 1,000 people that we uh, had uh, interrupted their therapy on and notified them that we were going to be changing this and they were going to have to go to uh, a local pharmacy in order to receive their medications. Next thing we did was uh, follow uh, the FDA guidelines and, and their recommendations, and we put a limit of four grams of acetaminophen per day on any combination prescription. So if people were getting either opioids or other medications that had uh, Tylenol or acetaminophen in it, such as uh, cough and cold medications, we put a limit that no more than four grams a day at the point of sale, that they were limit, limited to that. The next big component was our short-acting opioids. And what we did was we actually put in a, uh, a point of sale edit that allowed a person to get up to two 15-day supplies of an opioid within a 60-day rolling period. Um, and after that, they would require prior off. Uh, and after a couple of months, we realized that some of the dentists who were actually prescribing appropriately, giving out two days here, then followed up by three days if pain still occurred, were hitting the block. So we actually modified that and allowed uh, multiple fills, um, but no more than 15 at, uh, at a time uh, for two supply, two 15-day supplies at a time within that rolling 60-day period. So again, they were able to get two 15-day supplies max uh, within that 60 days or uh, smaller increments as long as it didn't exceed that. Uh, next, we put a prior authorization on all long-acting opioids. So anybody who did not have a short-acting opioid uh, in the history of their claim system in the previous 120 days got hit with a prior op. Prior auth at the point of sale uh, said, you know, must try a short-acting agent first or get prior auth. We also did for both of those prior auth programs, we allowed the pharmacist to dispense up to a three-day emergency supply. That way the, the member would go and at least be able to get a small amount uh, before having to go to a physician over the weekend or over a long holiday. Uh, and what we saw was the vast majority of the long-acting opioids did not pursue prior op. Rather, they switched to the short-acting opioids, and we saw actually about a 50% decrease in the use of long-acting opioids. We also developed an internal cross-functional team of pharmacists, nurses, physicians, our fraud unit, as well as our addictionologists um, and behavioral health folks to review outlier claims and actually work with physicians uh, and members uh, and determine if they needed to be locked down to a single prescriber or to a single pharmacy. Uh, and we've done that several times where necessary and communicated to the member that, you know, this is, this is how it is. If you're going to get this drug, this is where you have to go and this is who you have to get it prescribed from. In addition, we put a prior authorization on buprenorphine, suboxone, and combination products. Uh, that anything over 16 milligrams a day required a prior authorization. We're knowing full well that the FDA dosing is up to 24 milligrams a day. Based on our, the work from our addictionologist, uh, we really felt that 60, at 16 milligrams, your mu receptors are saturated. You're not going to accept anymore. There really isn't a clinical need for it. And anything over 16 days in terms of a request that comes in through our pharmacy area goes to her, she has a consult with the prescribing physician, they come up with a treatment plan and come to terms whether it's 
uh, dose reduction or pill counting and actually works with the provider and, and checks back in with them every three months to make sure things are working. Uh, we also have sent out outlier reports, both the individual and group practices to get them involved. We also did a change to our urine drug testing and put in annual limits because we saw an, uh, a, an overabundance of utilization on that. Uh, and finally, just recently, we uh, developed a, or are developing a series of educational videos that are put on by our medical directors for use with accounts um, and our municipalities, our uh, universities, uh, and some of our um, other labor and union groups so that they can see what it's all about. I, at the end under the slides, I did list uh, the YouTube site if you want to see it and look at it. It's a couple minutes long, but it just it goes to show uh, the, the perils of becoming addicted and, and really what health care is available for, for one who falls into that. So finally, our safety uh, program, um, as I explained, it can, it, we reached out to a bunch of physicians. Our prior authorization was not really aimed at trying to save money, but was really aimed at education and aimed at uh, safety. So with each prior authorization, we required a, a treatment plan and attestation from the physician that they had looked at other options. Uh, that they actually had a signed consent uh, uh, on file with the patient for a risk assessment. They had an, an opioid agreement between the patient and prescriber outlining the expectations of both uh, and that they were willing to limit opioid prescribing to a single uh, pharmacy or single prescriber as, as clinically necessary. So since we rolled our program out um, three years ago, we actually had a, uh, a decrease in 21 million fewer doses of opioids being dispensed since we initiated the program. Again, I mentioned ca cancer patients and terminally ill patients are excluded, either based on um, the information provided to us through the prior auth or from claims uh, diags or from uh, claims history. We do have an addictionologist on staff who has been excellent uh, uh, consult for us with respect to reaching out to physicians. And in Massachusetts, naloxone, we do cover naloxone at tier one and participating pharmacies that have a prescribing agreement with a, an on-call physician so that they can get it without a prescription. They can just walk in, get uh, get the two, two or three doses, whatever they're uh, order is for and then walk away with just their co-payment, no prescription necessary. So with that, it's references and uh, I will turn it back over. Uh, I know I have questions, but we'll hold those till later and I'll turn it back over to Catherine.